welcome you all to this webinar on developmental supportive care by dr manisha bandarkar who is a professor from jawaharlal uh, nehru medical college from karnataka uh, ma'am uh, over to you ma'am please go ahead okay uh, thank you very much and um, thanks to the nnf unicef uh, team for giving me the opportunity today to talk to all the uh, nurses medical officers pediatricians uh, who are involved in taking care of the newborns in the essentials in the four states that we are um addressing uh, this particular project too am i audible clearly yes ma'am you are audible okay. please okay. go ahead okay. fine okay um so uh, this uh, last uh, few weeks we have been discussing uh, about the care of preterm babies this particular module uh, was for care of preterm babies and today's is the last session in that uh, we have looked at uh, how to uh, take care of the preterms from the feeding point of view then we looked at what is the how to provide care in the first golden hour then last week uh, there was discussion about uh, kangaroo mother care the importance of it the benefits of it and today uh, we are going to talk about the developmentally supportive care which is an essential part of uh, providing uh, standard of care uh, to the preterm new uh, preterm babies uh, whom we take care of in our nicus and essentials well we all know a baby is supposed to be in the womb cushioned from the noise light touch as well as uh, being supported from all the sides by the walls of the uterine cavity and uh, probably the baby is supposed to be is expected to be supposed to be there for at least this 9 months and 7 uh, days however there are those certain babies who have to come out whether it is because of various reasons it could be uh, for the maternal reason or for the uh, baby safety either they come out on their own they deliver on their own or they have to be delivered for whatever the reasons and this baby who is supposed to be cushioned from all these uh, um, external factors as soon as the baby is out we can see that uh, this baby is put on this uh, open care or this warmers and gets exposed to the noise the beeping noise of the alarms definitely the first exposure is to the um, touch of uh, the unknown touch of uh, the people taking care of the baby and of course it is uh, unavoidable if we have to take care of the baby then uh, the iv lines because many a times these preterm babies are not able to feed for themselves and that's why we they get uh, we have to uh, prick them put them on iv lines the position the position which was supposed to be nicely universally flexed position in utero it gets affected as soon as the baby is placed uh, horizontally onto this open cares or warmers and of course the bright environment of a nicus at ensensius so we can imagine what hostile environment this little baby uh, has to face the as soon as the baby is outside into the extra uterine environment and that is what all developmentally supportive care about developmentally supportive care is about providing a structured care environment which supports encourages and guides the developmental organization of the premature or critically ill infant what the baby is supposed to be have uh, has is supposed to um, experience in utero and which is supposed to be uh, meant for a normal development not just of the various organs 
including the neurological system of the baby, but as well as all the senses of the baby also. So that is what the structure environment baby is supposed to be having in utero. And if the baby is born early, we or for whatever reasons, baby, as soon as the baby is born, baby becomes critically ill, even in case of term babies, we have to at least ensure that we reduce the stress of being in the NICU and if possible, promote the boom-like growth in case of preterm babies. And that is all the developmentally supportive care is about. Now, if we look at how especially, and the most important part of this developmentally supportive care is of course taking care of the baby's neurological system. And if we just look at this uh, picture, we see that the neurons are developing inside the brain in the first, second, and at the, in the third trimester. And there is a particular pattern of this neuronal development, those little cells which are there in the brain, uh, which, uh, which are the most, the functional units of the, uh, this brain. Uh, so they keep developing through all the three trimesters. And there is a particular pattern to this development. So if a baby is born early, this particular pattern of development, which was supposed to happen in utero, because of the exposure of the baby to various stressful factors ex utero, they may not start developing in the same, they, they may not develop in the same pattern. And that is what is going to affect the baby's further neurodevelopment. And we all, uh, who are taking care of these uh, preterms pre in the NICU and SNCU, we all always would like to ensure that when this baby, it's just not the survival of our little preterm baby, but it is the intact survival. So when this baby goes out of our NICU, grows and develops, we would like to ensure that this baby, uh, baby grows into a competent, normal individual and does not suffer from the, because of the stress the baby has uh, faced when the baby was in the NICU. So that is whole, uh, the principle behind giving this developmentally supportive care in the NICU. So why is it important to uh, ensure that this care is given? As I said, uh, there is the, the neurons, those uh, cells, the functional units of the brain, they are developing in, in the brain throughout the three trimesters. But even more important than that, that they're developing in a particular sequence. And uh, there is the, mm, uh, the, the sequence, of course, is during the growth of the baby in utero. The tactile and the vestibular uh, sensation, tactile is the touch sensation, vestibular is the movement sensation. So that is what is gets matured, following which is the gustatory and olfactory, that is the, touch, the taste and olfactory is the smell. So those sensations and then is the auditory and visual sensations. So there is sort of a pattern not basically it would not be a uh, once uh, it it would be sort of it may happen simultaneously also at some stages but that is some pattern that is there in the development of the neonatal sensory system when in utero and so when this baby comes out into the extra uterine environment, which is hostile, which is new to the baby, we have to try to ensure that when we stimulate, we uh, ensure that the baby's sensory system is supported in the same particular sequence so that the, it helps for the baby's uh, sensory system also to grow in that particular sequence, sort of to uh, simulate the intrauterine environment. And so what are the core components of developmentally supportive care? There are five core components which we have to remember when we are taking care of them. The first is protected sleep. I will go through the details of each one of them later on. The second is the pain protection. The third is developmentally supportive activities of daily living. The fourth is a family-centered care. And fifth is healing environment.
there will be beautiful videos which will be shown to you uh, at the end of this presentation which will make you understand even better what it all means but i will try to explain to you in uh, in this short time the best what i can what each one of these mean coming to the tactile sensation so the this is the first sense sense to form uh, when during in utero growth and probably it starts somewhere around 8 weeks and it starts begins with the sensory receptor development in the face mostly in the on the lips and the nose so this baby who was not uh, known to be touched directly uh, when the baby is in utero when the baby is born baby gets uh the the direct touch on the baby is what is the first sensation that the baby will start experiencing and that is what the first sensation which develops in a newborn in in utero so what are the ways how we can ensure that this tactile sensation which the baby is going to have how do we promote it in the most uh Uh, the best way in order to uh, so that the baby feels uh, uh, the same sensation as the baby is in utero and one of the most important thing in this is positioning of the baby now this is what is the uh, universal flexion position that a baby has in utero and it is important that when the baby this preterm baby is outside we maintain we help the baby to maintain this uh, universal flexion position so that it helps in not just the development of the tone the way it was supposed to be when the baby was in utero but baby feels secure as well and then there is something called as nesting so if you see around this baby there are uh, this nesting has been done using the cloth there are various ways of doing nesting uh, so i think one of that has been shown in the video but then uh, it can it, uh, every unit can develop their own ways simple ways of doing this nesting what it makes the baby feel a baby can feel the boundaries a baby when is in utero has the uterine walls around the baby so when the baby pushes uh, the legs or the hands baby will feel these boundaries around him or her and that is what makes the baby feel secure so when the baby is out we also need to ensure that we give the baby the position which the baby is supposed to be neutral and also give those boundaries because of the uh, with the help of the nesting so it is uh, important that the um, uh, place changing the position of the baby not just to keep the baby in the supine position all the time because that will not help to develop the baby's flexor tone the way it is supposed to be developing especially from 28 to 40 weeks that uh, the tone develops uh, basically from um, it it develops from caudocephalic uh, direction that is from the legs to the um neck so that is how this tone develops the flexor tone so if the babies are born preterm we have to help the babies to uh, by keeping them in the flex position so that it we help them to develop that tone and not just the side, the uh, the positioning of uh, the flexor tone or this putting the baby in flex position in side lining but also to put the baby in the prone position along with the nesting so that is that is what will help the baby feel secure feel the boundaries and help to develop the normal tone swaddling and facilitated tuck are also two more important ways which makes the baby help uh, which helps the baby to stay in, in that position baby feels secure and can maintain the position because it's so vulnerable if the baby's uh, hands or legs are lying extended the little preterm baby does not have the strength to lift it and bring it into the flexed position so that is why this facilitated tuck is also essential so that we help the baby maintain that posture along with this it is important that we promote the midline alignment if we see a baby in utero we always find the baby's hands are in the midline especially near the face so that is what we need to promote this midline al uh, alignment we have to swaddle and cover to keep in a flex position and very important is the protected sleep what do we mean by protected sleep it is also an important part of cluster care which i am going to talk about later on so when a baby is asleep 
we should not be disturbing the baby uh, with noise or with bright light or unnecessarily touching the baby uh, or unnecessarily going and checking the baby's diapers if that needs to be checked or uh, waking the baby just to uh, put an IV line. So all these things uh, should be avoided uh, when a baby is asleep so that because that is what helps the baby to grow uh, and grow normally. So protected sleep is also an important part of uh, ensuring that uh, the baby gets uh, developmentally supportive care. Another important part of developing tactile sensations is massage therapy. So this, of course, we don't start when the baby is uh, critically ill, but the, once the baby has settled, once the baby has uh, uh, hemodynamically well, then we, uh, we can start uh, with the massage therapy also. So that, of course, it should be done by a trained nursing staff or whoever the caretaker is and ensure that it does not cause stress in the baby but uh, it makes the baby feel relaxed and the baby goes to sleep. So massage therapy is also an important part of developing the tactile sensations in a normal way. It is known to promote a normal neuro behavior in a preterm baby. It is, it is known to promote weight gain. It is known to help the baby sleep well. It reduces the pain it decreases the stress of the, and, 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 uh, this uh, baby being in a, a totally uh, hostile environment uh, in the NICU and in the hospital stay. And it has also shown that it decreases the number of days in the hospital if the massage therapy is started early and it is done properly. So that's also an important part of helping the baby to develop tactile sensation. Cluster care, what do we mean by cluster care? It is very important for the neonatal uh, nursing staff to know about it is we, as I said earlier, when whatever care we provide to these little babies, we have to try to do all this care in at one time and then leave the baby alone for uh, one to two hours so that baby sleeps peacefully. For example, if suppose the baby is due for feeding, uh, then we feed the baby, then we change the baby's nappy, then we ensure that the baby's IV lines are checked. If the baby has to receive any IV medication, all those things, or suppose if the baby is on the ventilator, if the baby's uh, ET suctioning has to be done, or whatever has to be done before the baby, we plan it. It is not that, uh, okay, I'm now, right now I'm free and let me go and give the IV injection to the baby. So if the baby is sleeping and if we start with the IV injection because of the pain baby will get up. So this is this is what should be avoided. So it is minimal handling of the baby and doing all care at one time so that then you leave the baby alone for one to two hours to sleep peacefully. This also ensures protected sleep. So cluster care is one of the very important part of developmentally supportive care. And it also minimizes the infection, hospital acquired infection because of less handling. Another thing which we should avoid is prolonged immobilization of the babies. Sometimes when there are IV lines in a particular hand, we fix that hand or we fix that leg. It's, or if we put pick line, then I've seen that it, that leg or that uh, hand gets fixed because we don't want the, um, that to get extra visited or whatever reason. But that doesn't work for preterm babies because the lack of this physical activity in a particular limb or for the whole body will lead to demineralization and growth retardation of bones in newborns. So this should be avoided. Coming to the pain management. So we talked about uh, the first part is the ensuring that the baby gets a uh, um, uh, the tactile sensation is taken care of then the pain management is equally important. Do babies feel pain? Yes, they do feel pain. We have to remember that. And they, they do recognize pain. Uh, what we need to recognize is the baby is in pain. And so there are various uh, ways of assessing the pain. Uh, there are, they are called as pain scales. I'm not going to go into details of it because uh, it is not uh, required at this point of our uh, training. However, those who are interested uh, in knowing them, they are easily available, this particular information, and can uh, 
can and if you are interested in using them in your day to day assessment of the newborn uh, uh, it can be used and it is definitely helpful so it is important for us to us uh, know that the baby is in pain we can assess it objectively also how much pain the baby is in and then how do we manage pain so it is important that we have this non formal pharmacological management of pain uh, for example if we need to do a hip prick uh for whatever reason you want to do sampling or you want to do whatever reason then if we put if we help uh, if we if we do it when the mother is around when the mother is feeding then it can reduce the pain for the baby or we can give non nutritive sucking to the baby with the mother or using whatever other uh, ways of providing non nutritive sucking uh, so in non nutritive sucking what it means is that baby is not getting the nutrition the breastfeeding but baby is actually sucking at the pacifier or whatever you provide so that that gives the um, sensation of uh, the ba baby is occupied with that and the level of pain the baby can feel will come down even swaddling and facilitated tuck so instead of just putting the baby over open uh, in the open care and going ahead and putting iv lines in the baby if we uh, swaddle the baby nicely keep the baby in a nice comfortable position and then do whatever we have to do even while putting uh, doing something like it is suctioning it is suctioning is also a painful procedure for the baby uh, so we have to ensure that when we are going to do such procedures uh, especially for the nursing staff i would say uh with of, of course we have to ensure that we follow aseptic precautions put your hands on the baby just make the baby feel comfortable and then go ahead with this procedure it is like telling the baby okay i'm going to do this procedure for you but then we will make sure that you are secure and you you feel safe so we have to be sort of convey this to the baby to and, and make sure that the baby feels uh, less pain uh, by using this non pharmacological management even massage therapy is also useful there are pharmacological uh, ways of uh, management of pain but that is what we will use if uh, a baby has undergone surgery or if a baby who is ventilated then we will use those uh, medications to keep the to help the baby lessen the pain in the baby the next sensation what we need to remember is the olfactory gustatory sensation that is the smell and the taste are there taste receptors in the baby newborn yes of course and probably they may be stimulated when the fetus starts following amniotic fluid so that is what the research has shown and probably the taste buds start developing since that time what about the smell yes babies can smell especially after 32 weeks it has been found that the neonates can discriminate between the taste and smell and they can remember their mother's smell and they get habituated to it so they know that this smell is from my mother so uh, that is why uh, there are a certain nicus who have this uh, protocol of of they ask the mother to leave a pad of uh, uh, which smells of the mother's milk next to the baby so that even when the baby mother is not there with the baby baby feels that the mother is around so babies do discriminate remember and habituate to all this uh, to both these uh, sensations and giving the breast milk kangaroo mother care and non nutritive sucking are the best forms of stimulating these senses so even putting the baby if, even if the proper suck swallow uh, coordination is not developed in a preterm baby if we put the baby to the mother's breast after emptying her breast and just allow the baby to suck at the nipple that is going to help the st stimulation of the senses uh, kangaroo mother care we know the baby is going to be with the mother next to the breast and that is going to definitely help develop this senses for the baby coming to the auditory uh, that is the uh, hearing so uh, when do the baby start listening or when do the baby start hearing lot of research has been done in this area and they have found that usually babies start responding to auditory stimuli by around 24 weeks of gestation it may be earlier but the research has shown that they start responding by around 24 weeks of gestation and infants that is uh, neonates have uh, the feet uh, the fetus in utero have even shown distinct preferences 
for the maternal voice by lowering their heart rate, which shows that the baby relaxes when the baby listens to the mother's heart. And that's what also has shown in the ex utero environment also. So which means that the baby recognizes the mother's voice. And when the baby knows that the baby mother is around, the baby relaxes by decreasing the heart rate. A study which has been published way back in 1975 have shown that if a baby is exposed to the adult uh, talk and especially this is the mother what they have saw, uh, shown is that every increase in the 100 adult word count in the NICU at 32 weeks of gestation so if the baby listens to the word count more extra words uh, and for the every 100 words, there is a two point increase in the baby's developmental quotient, the baby's developmental uh, uh, quotient uh, at around one and a half year, that is at around 18 months. So listening is a part it, that definitely it is one sensation which develops, which has developed in utero and uh, ensuring that it develops ex utero also by uh, especially ensuring that the mother talks to the baby. That is very important. When the mother talks to the baby, baby feels most relaxed and the more they talk, there are the same, the all the connections, the wiring inside the brain, it helps it the more and it has been found that it can help to uh, increase the baby's uh, developmental quotient by uh, using the um, objective assessment, uh, developmental assessment tests. So it is not just listen. It is not just that the listening helps in developing the sensation. At the same time, the noise level in the NICU can also affect the baby adversely if not taken care of properly. It can, of course, if the baby is exposed to loud sound, then baby can have physiological and behavioral disturbances. The baby will wake up, will start crying, there'll be changes in the heart rate, maybe changes in the oxygen saturation level. So that is a stress that baby will be exposed to frequently, which will lead to impaired growth and development of the baby. So the weight gain is going to get impaired. Baby will have sleep deprivation if there is constant noise in the NICU. Of course, the frequent waking up, frequent crying can cause more hypoxemia in the baby, tachycardia in the baby. This can again lead to increased intracranial pressure. And then again, we can it can affect the baby's, uh, the growth of the baby's brain. And, uh, and the, what we, uh, we, we are more even more concerned about is the hearing impairment because the research has shown that loud noise, consistent exposure to this noise in the NICU, especially for preterm babies, can have increased, these babies have been shown to be, to have increased hearing impairment. As it is, we know that the in, neonates who, that the NICU graduates, what we say, who come out of the NICU are at higher risk of having hearing impairment. Those who are exposed to high, uh, to loud no, voice noises in NICU uh, do have even higher chances of hearing impairment. So what should be the noise level or what should be the voice level when we talk to a baby. What is recommended is it should be less than 45 to 50 decibels. That is what the accepted uh, sound which the baby is comfortable with when the baby is in the NICU. And what are the sounds that we hear around us? I mean, these are uh, there's a list and we all will are familiar with this. Just closing the door behind us when we walk out of the essence here and I see you conversation, especially while giving handovers. And that is the time people who are going out are so excited about it. Those who are coming in want to know what's happening to the baby. And that is the time we lose control over the over the, uh, the level of the no this uh, our conversation that happens between us. The same thing happens with the residents, with the consultants. Sometimes we suddenly raise our voices in the NICU, in the SNCU. We don't realize and we can see that it goes up till 80 to 90 decibels, even double the what is expected to be when we are next to the baby. So it is important that we don't discuss next uh, standing next to the baby. Whatever discussions have to happen can come uh, happen when you all come back to the nursing station and discuss over there, which should be away from the baby's bed. Ventilator alarms. Many times it goes on alarming. And if we don't pay, we sometimes fail to pay attention to that. Nebulizers, which are used. 
telephones they keep ringing sometimes you know uh, and then we don't realize uh, the noise level that it will create the monitor alarms the ventilator compressor iv infusion alarm sometimes when the iv fluids gets uh, over into that infusion alarm it can it will keep beeping uh, during even the endotracheal aspiration even that time that unit can cause a, a high levels up to 70 to 85 decibels gas central gas supply also so each one of them once we go back uh, once you listen to this uh, uh, this um, talk and once we become aware about what can cause the noise around us which is uncomfortable baby to the baby not just uncomfortable helpful to the baby let us get aware about this and take uh, action in our day to day uh, practice and next comes the vision so uh, of course, uh, it, it, we expect the baby who is there in utero who may not have received adequate stimulation until after birth to further growth of the uh, further vis visual sensation. And especially a pre jump baby uh, who is not supposed to be ready to come out into this world and open eyes. So the visual receptors will not have, wouldn't have received that much of adequate stimulation until after birth in these babies. And it is, uh, the studies have shown probably it is the last developing sense at around 26 weeks of uh, age uh, in utero, wherein uh, it is shown that the infant consistently blinks to the light. So this is what this research has shown. Whether it is uh, it uh, it is uh, it may be getting mature earlier in some babies, but overall, what has been found by around 26 weeks, it starts they start blinking to the light. By around 32 weeks, they show some signs of fixation if the way, if the object is close to them, and by around 37 weeks, uh, they start turning towards the soft light. They may follow the light a little bit. Okay, so these are just this is what we need to remember is that if the baby who has come out. Uh, in the extra uterine environment gets exposed to the bright light which the baby was not supposed to be when the baby was in utero then the normal brain cell activity which is supposed to be developing the way it is was supposed to be developing that will change and this will result in uh, the, the uh, ensuring the normal growth may not happen so development may not happen and that is what we need to be aware about it is also it may lead to sleep deprivation again which will affect the growth and development of the baby. What has been found is neonates who have been exposed to cycle light. What it means is in the environment, the, uh, the lights in the NICU, if they're bright during the day and dim at night, you will see this in the video later on. So that is why I have not showing the video here. If we follow that sort of, we, we give this cycle light and help to develop that circadian rhythm in the baby, it has been found that it helps the babies to gain weight while they are in the NICU as well as after discharge. It has been found that they feel better uh, orally, they have lesser days on the ventilator, they have better motor coordination, they are less anxious, they cry less, they sleep well and are more active during the day. And that is what we want, right? When, when this baby are growing. So ensuring that they have proper exposure to the light, uh, especially when we are doing procedures. Then we suddenly switch on the spotlight to do the procedure, but we have to be aware that we cover baby's eyes during that time. The other ways is if the baby is in the incubator, we can cover the baby's incubator uh, with a cloth from top so that baby does not get exposed to the bright light. The ambient lighting in the infant care area, it is somewhere expected from 10 to 600 lux which has to be adjustable depending upon how are we examining the baby or we are handling the baby for some time. And in case of procedure lighting, if there is any procedure like putting a pick line or whatever we are going to do, then around 2000 lux for critical areas. But at the same time, we have to cover the baby's eyes. And access to day day daylight is important, but uh, with controls to limit the direct sunlight. So baby's uh, eyes should not be exposed to the direct sunlight. So that also needs to be taken care of. So this is about we have looked at all these four sensations so far. Then what is developmentally uh, supportive, uh, supportive of activities of daily living? What do we mean by that core component of developmentally supportive care? 
Now, this is what are the caregiving activities that are important that we do every day, every time because they're necessary for the baby's growth and development. But ensuring that each of this activity is comfortable for the baby. For example, just dressing and undressing the baby, putting the cap on the baby, uh, putting the socks for the baby, the gentle handling of the baby during this uh, during this process, even diaper change. For a little baby, that is could be something which is distressing. Baby does not want to be handled much. So we need to be careful, ensure that we have warm hands when we are going to uh, go, uh, we, when we're going to do the diaper change. Just putting uh, the, ha uh, uh, the hand over the baby to know the, the baby feels the touch and knows that something is going to be happening now. Instead of suddenly going and then, you know, uh, opening the diaper and going ahead with the changing of the diapers. doing While doing sponging, while doing massage, skin care, even feeding. When we are going to go and feed the baby, this is especially important for the staff nurses. It is not that, you know, whatever you do, whether you're giving a uh, pallida feeding, uh, spoon feeding, or whether you're going to do RT feeding, it's important that you gently wake the baby, talk to the baby, and then the baby knows that, okay, now something is expected, and then you feed the baby. Instead of just suddenly taking the feed, taking the RT, uh, holding the RT and pushing the feed in the baby's uh, fear, this tube, or suddenly uh, giving the spoon feed to the baby. Baby is not going to be comfortable with that. So these activities of daily uh, living which are going to be, be doing for the baby, they have to be done in a developmentally supportive way. At the same time, it is important that we encourage parents to do these activities of daily living in a developmentally supportive way because that is what they are going to do once they go home. And it is not just them, the extended family members, the grandmother or uh, you know aunt, they are all going to come into picture once this baby is going to go home. So they all need to be trained, involved and encouraged to ensure that they understand how to give this care. This will also foster bonding between them and the infant. So that is is why the mothers have to be encouraged to come to the SNCU to feed the baby, to talk to the baby. So she develops that bond between the baby. She should learn how to even sim some simple thing like changing diaper. That also something, especially if the baby is small, that is something which mother needs to know. Another thing is abrupt position change. This should be avoided as much as possible. Whatever we are going to do, it has to be done gently. Even when the baby is going to be given into kangaroo mother care, uh, this has been uh, uh, discussed last time. It is uh, advisable that the mother stands next to the open care and gently lifts the baby and puts it on her, puts the baby on her chest and then sits in the chair instead of we suddenly lifting the baby from the open care and handing over to the mother to put in the uh, KMC. So abrupt positions change is something which should be uh, avoided in case of especially these preterm babies or even the term babies critical who are critically ill and are coming out of the illness gentle movement helps to reduce the stress well family centered care uh, I mean, there is enough to talk about it. And uh, kangaroo mother care is the core component of this family-centered care because that is something which not just uh, stimulates all the senses of the baby, but it also helps to develop the bonding between the parents and the mother. And here we see that even if the mother is not comfortable to feed the baby, let her just sit with the baby and then we, the nurses can help to feed the baby. So it is important that the the whatever we do with the way uh, the care that is provided the family gets involved uh, the family understands what to be what is to be done the mother develops the rapport with the baby understands her baby's uh, limitations also and so is prepared to take care of the baby when she takes the baby home Certain special advantages of KMC, it has all been spoken last time, but just to reiterate, even the mother's rhythmic breathing and the chest movement is a very soothing experience for the preterm baby when the baby is in KMC and hence babies love this particular uh, uh, to be being in KMC. And of course, what I so just now spoke about while putting the baby also in KMC, the mother has to be uh, trained how to take it. So finally, what are the key messages in development? Uh, what do we want to say? So we have looked at all the five core components of uh, developmentally supportive care, uh, which are as important as giving uh, the time we spend in giving the critical care for a critically ill infant. 
as important as, as that is giving this developmentally supportive care to the baby who is uh, coming out of that critical care or to a preterm baby right from the time the baby is delivered so that we ensure that the baby's development happens in a um, developmentally supportive way. So developmentally supportive care is no, it reduces stress and it promotes growth. It is important that we understand the principle of this stimulation of the senses so that uh, we, when we start handling these babies, we are aware about it. Kangaroo mother care is the best form of developmentally supportive care because it just satisfies all the five components of the developmentally supportive care, the core components. And that is why it has to be encouraged as early as possible. Uh, maybe even immediately after birth, that is what is now the recent research has shown. So we should remember these five core components of DSC, but at the same time, it has to be individualized based on the baby's cues. So uh, certain things baby may not be comfortable, certain position baby not may not be comfortable, uh, certain uh, ways of handling the baby may not be comfortable. So we should understand the cues of the infant and the developmentally supportive care has to be tuned as per the infants uh, of in, as per the requirement of the preterm baby. So uh, that's what I wanted to say about developmentally supportive care. Thank you very much for giving me the chance. And of course, what is the uh, the best out? You know, what is it that we gain? These uh, little uh, twins, uh, one they were born at 26 weeks. Uh, one is was 610 grams and the other one, the boy was 740 grams. Now they are more, it's, they're nearly one and a half to two years old and they're developing uh, normally. Uh, so when we look at this, the happiness that we get, it is immeasurable and that is why developmentally supportive care is absolutely essential. Thank you very much for uh, your patient listening. And uh, if there are any questions, we can discuss them later. Uh, there are two nice videos which will be shown uh, and uh, they are going to sort of uh, show you all that I have discussed earlier. So please watch those videos as well. Neha, you are not audible. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Audible. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing the information. It was very in enlightening as we got to know about the five core components of the developmental supportive care. And it was very interesting to know that uh, even telephone uh, rings and fire alarms would affect the hearing of the baby. Uh, it was very informative uh, presentation. I would like to thank you once again for taking out your time and uh, uh, training all our staff and uh, enlightening this information. Thank you, ma'am.